Hey guys. So here we are. It is actually a little cold here today. It was raining and cold and windy. So it was a little bit of a, of a rough day, but uh, I actually spent, uh, I spent a lot of time last night, not gonna lie, on my lecture for tonight in Team Tate Academy. I hope you guys are either in the Academy already or look special for this one because I have like so many pages of notes here <laughs> for my lecture tonight on how horses learn best. And it was just really, really fun to actually do this research. And so I was lucky enough not to have to be outside in the rain today, this morning anyway, because I was finishing up the lecture. And a huge thank you to my team at the Team Tate Academy and Red Mare Enterprise for creating the slides and just being totally awesome in all ways. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely want to get into that a little bit in a minute, um, but I do need to make like a couple of announcements just because that's what we do. Here on Wine About It Wednesdays, we have our wine and it's all about you know, toasting to something. Great that happened. Something great we learned, which usually comes from not great things happening. <laughs> but um, we had a great horse show last weekend. Um, Jessica Davis, my one of my trainers here at uh, Team Tate Dressage, she took Arthur and Jessica Greenwood's um, four-year-old Duke of Tryon to his second show of the year. He did the materiel, it was like an 88%, like nine and a half on the walk, nine and overall, like he was so good. It was like this amazing score and we were so happy. Uh, well deserved, he's so well ridden and he loves and trusts Jess and she rides him beautifully and it's really fun for me to watch. She also rode Debbie Brown's um, Morocco, so I don't know, uh, Melissa McKenzie, if you're on here, um, Rocco's doing great. They showed second level, um, 66, 65%. So really happy with that as well. And just in general, like Jessica's riding is just so harmonious and beautiful and it's made me so proud. <laughs> uh, she's been a student for about 13 years. We were laughing about that, uh, in the warm up. And, you know, when I was doing all this research for, this lecture, um, Jess has trained Mustang. She's done the Mustang makeover. We talk about horse training all the time and just horse psyche. And it's just been a really fun adventure to have her out here and uh, train some of the horses. And, um, you know, it's great to share space. Uh, Ashley Perkins is here too. You guys all know Ashley really well because she's one of my tack room chat coaches. Um, as well as my right-hand girl as well. Um, so yeah, it's just been a really fun environment here with everybody and um, discussing horses, different personalities, how they learn, and then to watch Jess have such a successful horse show. She got a 85.8 uh, on the four-year-old test on Sunday. So Duke got his ticket to Chicago, so that's exciting. And yeah, we're just really, really proud. Um, if you scroll down, you can see that Jess, we shared a video of her doing some Liberty training with Duke, who is again, a four-year-old stallion. <laughs> and yeah, it's just really fun to watch their relationship develop and uh, help her bring the best out of his gates. And yeah, just, it's really fun to have really great horses around. Going through the week. What else is happening? I've got a podcast dropping on Friday, Dressage Life with JJ Tate. Check it out. It's just so fun to be on Apple. Um, still makes me freak out a little bit. <laughs> uh, my dad and my stepmom Jen were here. That was a fun visit. We did a little horses. We did a little out on the boat, uh, you know, a little rest and relaxation. So that was nice as well. And, oh, and how could I forget that this was not the first thing I said, was that I am fully vaccinated. Yay. So I'm happy to come teach clinics. <laughs> um, we already posted 
I'm doing a little Wisconsin, uh, Kentucky tour. Gonna go visit my mom and see my dad probably again. And we're doing a little tour. I'm, I'm driving home, so I'm gonna teach my way back to South Carolina. Uh, that worked really well. I think it was over Thanksgiving. Uh, that was a lot of fun. So we're gonna do that again. And you can check out the dates and see if there's any spots. I would love to meet new people. I love to see my regulars. Um, yeah, it's great. So excited about that. And yeah, I've got a couple of different um, dates. I'm going to go to Maine in, later in the like fall, like early fall, I think. Um, so yeah, we'll get those up. We'd love to meet new people. We'd love to have you guys join the Academy because I've been like reviewing so many of the videos lately and I just got to say, they're just really helpful. And going along with all these lectures, they're so full of information and great examples and just food for thought. You know, it's just something, one of those things if you just want to like think about horses, you know, whenever I would look at my notes from Charles or hear him talking about something, I would always ride better. And, you know, thinking about those same concepts and delivering those in a way that's really easy to understand. Um, you know, I just want to help everybody be able to get more out of their lessons at home and yeah, understand a little bit more the depth of the content that we're, that we're working on. And, oh, and Devin, we really are want to make this like the best show ever. So please, please, please donate. Um, Team Tate Academy is going to give $2,500. I hope you can match me or give $500 or anything. Bueller. <laughs> we love Devin. We've got some really amazing things planned for the live stream. We really want to make Devin the best show ever. So we all need your help. So check that out on their website as well. And yeah, so now for my lecture. Uh, I mean, it's not actually a full lecture because that's going to be at eight o'clock and that'll probably last an hour and a half. I just brought all my books and it just, it, it really just took off. You know, I was thinking about, you know, how do my horses work so hard for me? I've got all kinds of different sizes, shapes, personalities, ages, you know, and they all eagerly want to do what I ask. And so it's always been like this lifelong understanding of how does that happen? Like, how do you create that? And I know like a big part of that is having Charles in my life from a very young age. And so, so much of this is part of my upbringing, you know, Gail Kelm, who I'm going to see next Sunday. Um, you know, just this, this thoughtfulness of how to approach horses just sort of like lives in me and this compassion and empathy I think is really felt by the horse. And so a lot of the information I am giving to them is received in a way that is just in a, in a place of communion, you know, and uh, of unity. So I got thinking about like, what do I want to do the lecture on? And I, it was, a, it was a big topic, you know, how horses learn best. And I am sure there are scientists out there who could go deeper into all of these things. But this has worked for me for a very long time. All my horses, you know, are excited to see me. And yes, Kelly, there are sugar cubes. Now sugar-free cookies, because some can't have sugar. <laughs> so we, we always have, I always have cookies in my pocket. That's like rule one is do not ever let go. Rule two is always have sugar in your pocket. <laughs> rule three is review the first two rules, especially rule one. <laughs> but, you know, when we talk about what does that take, you know, to teach your horse actually, you know, that was, um, so many people are busy exercising their horses and like making them run through the exercises 
And like, does the horse actually learn what it's supposed to be doing? I really like to separate my workouts with teaching them the concept and then working in, a, in an exercise to build the strength. So um, Charles talks a lot about building strength and skill. And so I think about that skill part being, I'm gonna give this horse a skill set, whether that is dealing with nervousness or tension or distraction or he doesn't want to bend right like whatever that horse's like skill set is lacking i want to actually teach him how to have better skills at that and then when the horse has better skills then you can exercise it and that becomes strengthening and so i think that's interesting to be able to sort of like separate that into like a teaching phase versus an exercising phase. It's one of those things too, like if you go to a Zumba class, which hopefully soon we can all start going back to the gym and exercising normal and whatever, but when you learn a new dance, you don't just exercise to the music like right away. Like first you have to learn the steps so that you're not like running into everybody around you. And of course, this would only work in group lessons, which in America, no one really likes to do those very much, although I highly recommend them. Uh, when I lived in Budapest and was t uh, learning from Yula Dalos, I'd have like private lessons um, Monday to Friday, and Saturday was a big giant, like giant group lesson. Uh, Sundays were off. It was it was it was awesome. So you also had to make sure you did not run into anyone <laughs> in those lessons either. But you know, it's like there is this like learn the content and how to do it, and then use it in speed to build fitness or strength or whatever. But like going back to like one of the first things I think is super important about how horses learn is getting them in a relaxed state of mind. A horse, if a horse is to learn anything while they're nervous or scared or feeling intimidated, they, they, they put it in a part of their brain that you will not be able to retrieve it whenever you want. You know, like they may like do it in this like nervous state because you're like forcing them to do it, but it's never really like their idea and they never really fully accept doing it. Um, I remember one year in Florida, we got, uh, one of my clients rented this treadmill. So like the whole thing of like, I'm really old school. I like to hand walk. I like to tack walk like horse and metal, like kind of like freak me out and like get my anxiety level up. Uh, so the red queen, uh, were like, oh, that would be great for summer. Like, sure. She can go on it. She's very smart, but very high alert a lot of times. Uh, so I said to the lady, I'm like, yeah, that's cool. But like, you can put her on that thing. Like, I'm just gonna like stand over here and watch and I'm gonna give you a thumbs up. I hope it goes okay and no one like leaps off this thing. So she was walking on it and Summer's like walking on the treadmill, but like her nose was still like curled up. So the whole, like, she wasn't licking and chewing and soft eyeball. She, she kind of, she didn't have her hamster eye on, um, but she did not have her Bambi eye on either. So she was, like, walking and, like, she was doing it. But the lady was like, you can tell she hasn't totally fully accepted it yet because, like, her nose is wrinkled and she's like, I'm walking on the treadmill, but I don't think I like it, you know? And I'll never forget that. Because I never like look at her nose like when I'm riding her, so it was really interesting to watch her face, that like her body was actually doing it, but her mind was just closed to the idea that this whole treadmill thing was a good idea. So needless to say, she never really did it again because I did not need her that fit. Actually, <laughs> uh, the Red Queen fit fit as a racehorse would be probably a very unsafe idea. But anyway. Uh, it was a great experience and it was very interesting to see that the horse could physically be doing something but not really mentally or emotionally present and accepting it. 
And so, you know, I always think about that too and actually reading all of these books. I mean, and it, it goes from Tom Doran's to, you know, um, Brigadier Albrecht, Udo Berger, um, Podaisky, Franz Meringer, like so amazing, these masters. And absolutely, absolutely every single one of them talked about the most important part of teaching a horse is to understand the horse. So that was so much fun actually to pull out these quotes from all of these books on, you know, what, is, what does that even mean? You know, it wasn't like this technique of, you know, make sure you do this or, you know, the horse needs to be, you know, punished. It was so about like, first off, check yourself. Like, what are you doing that might be causing the horse to do this? Number two, you have to understand the horse's psyche and who your horse is, not only as an individual, but like also as a species, like what do they, what are they protecting? You know, what do they want to be doing? And when you can understand that, A, you're not going to take it that personal when the horse doesn't do it, but also it's just going to give you this like freedom to just like, it's okay, whatever happens. Um, a lot of times we get very like goal orientated because a lot of us are like A type personalities of like the perfectionist and all this that we got to like get the shoulder and angle just right, you know, and it's, and it's good to be committed to clear, precise principles, but we also can't let that get in our way of the magic, you know, that really is why we're doing this. Like to be a partner with our horses is really what the whole fun part about it is. And today actually Alice uh, Greenstone's here and she was writing Norma Jean, who I just took two more videos for her in the academy. So you're all gonna enjoy more Norma Jean. And we were talking about connection and how it's so much about like holding someone's hand. And it's quite intimate, this feeling of connection to the horse's mouth and how much contact that horse wants and what kind of contact that horse wants. And, you know, when she does what she's going to do in her resistance, like where does that come from? And then how do you deal with that? Again, it was really fun to go through this whole plethora of amazing books by these masters and, and really break it down into, you know, if we, if we don't know horses, we cannot teach them. Um, one of the wonderful pieces about um, understanding the horse from P Principles of Dressage by um, General Albrecht was, you know, the mutual understanding is the foundation of the education of horse and rider. And two really important conditions is that number one, he needs to inquire insight into the mind of horses and empathy really came in and it's so cool to read these old books from these like master horsemen you know that they all every single one spoke about learning the inside of the horse and that truly is empathy and compassion and you know you think about like oh you know these like strong masters from years ago they weren't softies you know because like somehow that's like being a softie if you actually like care what your horse is thinking um and they absolutely all said that you know it was all about you have to learn your horse and have this empathy to think like the horse thinks uh, the second part of this was uh, the rider needs to learn thoroughly how to use the physical aids. And so again, it was like, if you school your horse properly and if you aid him properly and you ride the absolute best possible way, you're probably not going to run into that many problems. And so that's actually the challenge. How can I ride better? You know, and I love because Charles is always like, 
you always have to remember it's a riding sport and not a horsing sport. <laughs> and, you know, it's hard because, like, even at the horse show, I'm watching Jess ride so exquisitely and harmoniously and beautifully and quiet. And the horses are confident and powerful, yet not tense at all. And, you know, there's so much like busy and erratic and out of rhythm and blah, you know, it's like just the energy is just like, woo, you know, and like really controlling yourself and, and riding, thinking about your own self and how you relate to the horse, how you're speaking to the horse, what kind of tone are your aids taking? Like, is my hand too strong? Is my leg too busy? You know, like, am I, am I too quick to act, you know, when the horse doesn't do what I want, you know, right away? It's so much of like this interpersonal journey. And a lot of people are busy like horsing, you know, like I've got to like ride, I got to ride the horse and he has to do this. And it's just, it's like, it has to kind of like, you know, swivel that back and like look to yourself. Uh... And again, in this same book, uh, I had to write down this quote because I loved it. It was, craftsmanship has to be acquired by cons consistent work. Chopping the wood, that should all sound familiar to y'all. <laughs> One of the essential conditions of being able to apply theoretical knowledge to the practical task of educating a horse is the right attitude of mind. I mean, th literally, this was in every single book and I just like pulled little pieces out of all these books that they absolutely all, you know, said the same thing about you must be in a mental place to allow and create the connection that the horse is looking for. Horses are herd animals. They they want this um Tom Dorrance actually calls it togetherness, which I loved. He had, you know, kind of talked about like how he could describe it and uh, nothing really stuck except like togetherness and I actually wrote down in the margin of the book um, that's connection for me that's connection I know I talk a lot about in dressage like connection like into the contact like what does it feel like but that like spiritual emotional connection um, where I my goal is that I think and the horse does and we look like one unit um, you know, that's, that's the name of the game and that, 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 that's everyone's goal. You know, that's not like, well, I would also like to ride in the Olympics. And of course I would like to do that too. But for me, if I went to the Olympics and rode like crap and rode like really strong and ugly, you know, like that would, like that would totally take the joy away of what am I striving for every day? You know, that's why I love riding Norma Jean. You know, because she's like a little tiny church for me. And she pulls me into this place of quiet, calm, slow, steady, patient, empathetic, and compassionate. <laughs> like, she just pulls that out of me. And that's why I enjoy riding her so much. You know, I mean, Norma Jean, as a 20-year-old Morgan, is not going to take me to the Olympics. And I still absolutely love and cherish the time I get to spend with her because that's really so much about like what it is. Like how can I be a better person? <laughs> what can this horse show me about myself that I could improve? You know, because we're all, we're all on this journey, of constant improvement. And these horses just kind of like, put up the mirror and they're like, so this is you and you should be different. <laughs> so it's like this constant, uh, you know, growth, you know, but that's, uh, that's what's fun about it. One of the next topics uh, I talk about in the lecture is aiding in a way that the horse can hear you. Um, and I love that title because first off, we're on the horse's body and their legs are moving in their own rhythm. So now like those legs are now your legs. And so 
We have to 100% be aiding, helping that horse in the timing of those aids. It was an interesting epiphany I had this week <laughs> that on a couple horses that I have trained like from four or five years old and then I have a couple horses that I have not trained that long and I didn't really realize that I do this but come to find out whenever I pick up the trot I always pick up the trot when the inside hind leg is leaving the ground and I had a little session with Montana where I was working on a little more expression in the passage and his left stifle is like his weaker leg. Um, and so I just like would very, very, like such a light, tiny tickle. I would like, as his left hind leg was leaving the ground and leaving the ground and leaving the ground, I just like touched him just a tiny bit with the stick. And this like left hind leg was like, whoa. And I mean, all of a sudden I got this passage I have never, like, he was so airborne and unbelievable, all because I just, like, fired up that weak corner, and that weak corner was able to fire up, and he was, like, firing on all cylinders. It was unbelievable. And I was like, whoa! So that was, like, the start of it. So then, on my 12 other horses I ride, I was like, hmm, what about that for you? Denali didn't think it was that cool <laughs> as he's seven. So he's like, this is, you know, too serious, you know. Um, Darby didn't need it because he's just always energetic all the time. Gideon's used to it. He's like, Ugh, not this again. Uh, but Romeo was also like really changed. And he had a really hard time actually going from walk, trot, walk, trot, walk, trot, from the left hind leg, going left, that I could just like trot and walk all on this left hind leg timing. And so again, when I talk about like, I make myself really understandable to my horses because I speak to them in their, their signature rhythm. And yeah, I regulate the tempo. Like I don't want them like, just running around in whatever tempo that they feel like it because speed, of course, is one of the horse's evasion. So we always want to make sure like I am controlling the tempo, but I um, let the horse express himself inside himself in a way. And so it's, it's very much um, particular, you know, like I very rarely, if ever, unless I'm on a like a young horse that needs to be corrected, and that's later in this lecture about uh, corrections. I never yell at the horse like, get up there, you know, like you hear that sometimes. And like my inquiring mind always says like, get up where? Like what needs to get up where? Like my hind, this hind leg or that hind leg or this shoulder or this head? Like what needs to get up? Get up and where should that get where should it get up to um and so i really ask my horses really specific questions very detailed and very rhythmical and then we don't really have that many uh, miscommunications that that happen um what else horses have wonderful memories so we have to be careful what we are teaching them because even if we're teaching them like we, we hope we're teaching them something we want to teach them, but sometimes we teach them things we don't want them to learn, but they learn it all the same. And they're only, they're like second behind elephants in the animal kingdom of being able to have a strong memory and, and remember things forever. I was just talking about this last week, I think about the chalkboard idea. Like you can, like you get a young horse, you start riding in your chalk, you can't ever, ever, never, ever take a wet sponge and just clear it out. Nope, they do not forget any of the things, whether they, how they learn to tie, pick up their feet, whatever, like horses remember. So we always have to make sure we're really conscientious about that and giving them as positive of an experience as possible.
Um, we went into Udo Berger's book, The Way to Perfect Horsemanship. Um, oh, I love this too. The, the aids must be adapted to the degree of understanding and physical strength of the horse. This is something I see all the time with experienced riders getting on green horses. And I get that because I do that every day. It's really hard to work on a master's degree and then go back to like second grade. And I'm not honestly even sure what kids learn in second grade. So I'm like, I can't speak this simply, <laughs> you know? I just wanna like, you know, help the horse and control it and like put the balance over here and da, da, da. And the baby horse is like, what? Like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I love that, that the aids must be adapted to the understanding and the strength. So I can't give third level aids on Freddie, who's five years old and like first level. And so for me, I like to challenge myself and be able to categorize um, and like compartmentalize. This horse needs these aids. I'm gonna pull this first level drawer out. Um, you know, this horse is Grand Prix. I can ride him and actually he's international Grand Prix and not his first year at Grand Prix, because that's also very different. And so I really work on every day being really conscientious of, of coming to those horses, really knowing who I need to be, you know, for, for them. Um, tactfulness and feel is the quality that creates unity of mind and purpose. Again, going back to understanding the horses psyche and brain and then uh, Tom Dorrance goes into you know how horses have such a strong desire for connection and it's so easy to destroy the confidence and the closeness of that um, you know and I just always think of Walter Zettel and that everything is like this you know matter you know matter of trust and it's just so it's so true and you can wreck that trust really quickly. It can take years and years to build up that trust. And in one, you know, rough lesson in a clinic or, you know, just a, a day you're just frustrated and you just are like, Argh. that, like, you have to be careful because it, you, you can wreck it and ruin it so quickly. What took so long to create. Another big concept we're going to talk about later is as, and Charles says this all the time, teaching is repeating. We just do it again. And like whenever he says that, it's just this like, I don't know, it just makes me totally relax that like, okay, the horse has never done this before. Let's say it's canter half pass because I'm on a young horse and is never, it's like I can hardly like turn on a 15 meter circle, you know? And he's like, oh, on the next long side, half pass in four steps. And I'm always like, he's never done that before. And Charles would just be like, teaching is repeating. If it doesn't really happen or he trots or he throws his head up because he's out of balance, like we just repeat. Like, and then, you know, he'll say, do you know how many diagonals I had to ride of tempi changes before I got the count right. Like he just like opens up, he just like takes the top or takes the ceiling off of it. That it's like, yeah, just, just attempt it, like go for it. Start to gather the skills and gain the skills because if you don't ever do it, you're never gonna get any better at it. You can't wait till it's perfect. That's like waiting for something to be perfect to go to a horse show and like then you'll never go because we never are perfect um you know it's all about that just teaching is repeating uh and again back to the same idea of the strength and skill i talked about earlier i said when i am teaching an exercise and this is now not exercising this is in the skill set category i repeat until i feel the horse begin to understand and sort of work through the struggle um, sometimes a horse can get frustrated, like when I'm first teaching them how to yield off my leg, um, you know, they can get frustrated and like toss their head and like run through the half halt and just not want to be there, maybe kick at my leg or just halt and just like not understand. Um, so I like to stick with it long enough, not that, not that it gets perfect, 
but I need to feel a tiny, tiny, tiny effort that the horse is trying to do what I want. Or at least like making an effort to understand. Like, oh, do you mean move this leg? Yeah, yeah, yes I do, yes I do. And that really trains the horse to come, come with an answer, you know? Um, because a horse, you know, the, the wrong answer is better than no answer. So we want the horse to feel supported in that way uh, that they can at least give it a try. The next concept we talk about in the lecture is optimistic riding. And this is a concept from Charles where he'll, he'll always just say, whatever happens, just go with. And it's again, that's also like teaching is repeating. Just do it again. It's like this liberating feeling of, oh, whatever happens, just, you're just going to go with it. Oh, you wanted, a, you wanted a bigger trot and the horse cantered? Go with. Great. We love canter. We needed to canter on that lead again anyway. So that's great. Keep going. Put your leg on. Drive it and make it your idea. Something that's also deeply rooted in a horse's psyche is when, let's say we're cantering and the horse like breaks to trot. Chances are there probably was something in your body that signified to the horse that he should trot. And so he was attempting to listen. And if you were like, Ugh, like get after him and you'd be like, don't stop, you know, and you hit him with the whip, you know, that's like this, this counterdicting where he was like trying to listen to you and he was being really sensitive and you changed your seat bones a little bit or your outside leg went forward a tiny bit because you looked up at another horse coming into the arena and, the, and he trotted. So you, in essence, told him to trot and then you punished him for listening. And so then the horse is eventually going to be like, I don't know what she wants. So I'm just going to la 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 la. I'm just going to stop listening altogether. So I'm going to talk way into that uh, when we get into the lecture tonight because that's huge concept, huge concept. Another little nice tidbit I love is all weak horses feel lazy and behind the leg. So that was a, that's a statement in my life that has made a big, big impact. We're also going to talk about Horses that are location orientated, sometimes repeating something in the same spot can be super helpful. And then, of course, oh, the mother of all things, isometric resistance and pressure and release of pressure. I could go on and on and probably talk about that like just in a whole Wine About It Wednesday because this, this has a lot. This is a lot of notes here. Lots of stories attached to this one and a lot of notes. Um, I'll just add this one little quick quote from Charles that like, um, horses are claustrophobic. So quietly meet pressure with pressure. First step is obedience to the rider's will and softening to the pressure. Sta stabilization of the roundness is the first priority. All first energies go towards roundness and then towards transportation. So I love that too. Then I'm going to read a little excerpt from uh, Valdemir Sunig's Horsemanship about obedience. Then we get into making corrections and the whole concept of punishment. And I mean, that was also a real red thread that ran through every single one of these books is it's very rare that a horse actually needs punishment. Um, you know, it probably has been ruined by other people if it comes to that, but most times you can um, re-educate the horse and ride them better. And so like jerking on their face or whipping them with the whip really has no place in real horsemanship. So I love that too. Um, but that's a whole deeper topic and yeah, lots, lots and lots of stuff about that. Yeah, just really good quotes. There's so much. I'm probably going to do like a whole nother wine about it Wednesday about pressure and release of pressure because there's so many times I have a friend that's like, yeah, I had to go ride this horse and see if it could like take the pressure. And I'm just like, what does that even mean? <laughs> like I want it. I also want it to give to pressure, but 
I wanted to give to, from the lightest bit of pressure. Uh, and that's what I want to know, you know, not like, can I pressure it? And like, is it going to cope with pressure? It's like, I have a couple great horses up the hill that, uh, you know, would pop their, pop their lid if I put that much pressure on them. And I, and I would wreck them. They are so ambitious and so willing that if I put pressure on those horses like that, they would totally freak out and implode. <laughs> and then we would, you know, then it's just a horse in a pasture somewhere and uh, it doesn't need to be like that. So anyway, the conclusion is many great masters all agree. The main point is to understand horses. So it is on us to learn how to approach, handle, teach, show, expose, and care for these beautiful beings. And when we know better, we can do better. Thank you, Maya Angelou, for that. That's our slogan for the Academy. So if you guys all wanna learn more about stuff like this, um, join the Fundamentals, join the Academy. We'd love to see you guys in there. That's a wonderful, like-minded community. I can't wait to get myself organized for my lecture in about 15 minutes, so I gotta go. Cheers to understanding your horse, not only your horse, but horses as a species. They're all a lot more similar than you think. And yes, get to reading. These books are amazing. All right, thank you guys, and I'll see you soon. Make it a great day, bye.